Uh, I'm Jason. Uh, I'm the lead pastor here. Uh, two Mondays ago, I had a really bad just Sunday, Monday. I was tired, exhausted. I had spoke here at Restoration. It was awesome. But I just woke up in like a funk and I just was just had no peace in my life. And I'm like, I need some Jesus and I need something that I can control. And I felt like there was nothing I could control except I could go get my favorite cup of coffee at Novo Coffee. So I put on some comfy pants. I walked up the hill. I was like, man, I'm listening to some worship music. I can't wait to get my salted caramel latte from Novo and my bonfire breakfast burrito. Mm, slice of heaven if you've never had bonfire. So I order, and I'm getting in the like zone, like I'm reading the Bible, and all of a sudden they call my name up, and I go and I I get my coffee, and that day they didn't put it in like a mug, they put it in the go cup, and so I'm like, okay, whatever, grab it, grab my burrito, put it on my table, and then I go, I, I don't really want to sit in the chair, I want to sit in the booth, so I do the like. You know, there are the small tables and lots of people connected. So you got to do like the squat and scooch into the booth. So I'm squatting and scooching. Yet the table was one of those like, it was a little wobbly. And right when I scooched, my hip hit the table and the full latte just fell right into my lap. All of it. it wasn't a little spill, all of it. And to make matters worse, I brought the pants to show you. I had white pants on and... There is the coffee stain. Uh, some of the band asked me, is that the front or back by the color? It is the front. Uh, so I'm there with these pants on, like just chilling with about 25 people watching me. Just it's all over. I kept the AirPods in because I needed to keep the worship in my head. They made me my salted caramel latte again. I walk out the walk of shame eight blocks back to my house and just it's soaking wet. And now I have these pants as a reminder to remind me that when I think I have control over my life, I actually don't have that much control. I'm selling them for a hundred bucks. They're designer now. When I try to control my life, I honestly don't have that much control. I have spent so much of my life trying to control situations, trying to craft plans, trying to create things around my desires. And no matter how hard I try to control things, you know what? Unexpectedly, coffee spills. There's times in life where just coffee spills. I chase my desires. I chase situations. And when I think I have control, coffee can spill in your life, can't it? When we try to control situations, we realize how they are uncontrollable at times. Maybe for you, a coffee spill of your life is you plan a dream vacation. You're like, okay, we're going to go to the Alps. It's going to be amazing. We're going to hike. And you plan all the details. And then the day of your arrival, you get sick. You had all these things you controlled, yet you could not control getting sick. The coffee spills. Or... Maybe it's like you just got pregnant and things are really, really good, but then you go to a doctor's appointment and they give some really, really hard news. Coffee spills. Couldn't control it. Maybe you're here and you've actually done everything you wanted. Your business has grown. You've got everything you want. You can buy whatever you want, yet there's no way to optimize your life anymore. And you sit at home on your bed pillow. You lay there and you go, is this all there is? And you have a depression that is about your life that no one knows. The coffee spills. You can't control what you thought you could control. The truth is, no matter if you want to admit it or not, coffee will spill in your life. And you can't control what you want to control. And there is a core belief of why we want control in life. It's this, because we believe we know what is best for our lives. We want to control it because we believe we know what is best. Or you might want to control because you're fearful of life. So you're trying to control your life. If we are to follow Jesus, you are in church. So that's what we're going to talk about. If you're to follow Jesus... We must change this core belief. 
And we must admit that we do not know what is best for our lives. But Jesus does. That Jesus knows what is best. We need to admit that Jesus would do a better job leading our lives than we would. So over the next four weeks, what we're going to do is we've been in uh, the gospel of John and we're going to close out John. And we're going to focus on these last four weeks. We have a series titled King Jesus. In John 18, which we're going to study here in a moment, Jesus is actually going to call himself a king and he's setting up a kingdom. And he is going to ask you, are you in control of your life or is he king over your life? He wants to be king. That's what he wants. Throughout the Bible, though, we see God talk about himself being king. In Zechariah 14, 9, it says this, The Lord will be king over the whole earth. On that day, there will be one Lord, and his name, the only name. In Revelation, we see this about Jesus. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has the name written, King of kings, Lord of lords. Jesus calls himself king. He wants to be king. He wants this type of authority in your life. Yeah, you know, in our society, we don't live in a monarchy. We don't have a king. We're in the Western world. And if we're really honest, like none of us really want a king. We're pretty individualistic. We don't want anyone to control or have authority in our lives. Yet Jesus so interestingly uses the metaphor of king that he wants to be king over our lives. So what defines just a king? A king is just a sovereign ruler under ultimate authority. He has ultimate authority, having his followers acknowledge and submit to his reign. The authority, it extends over governance, lawmaking, taxation, justice systems, military directives. And Jesus says he wants to be king over your life. My question for you is this. Does Jesus hold this type of authority in your life? If he wants to be king, does he hold this type of authority in your life? King Jesus, he wants to guide every aspect of our existence. He invites you to surrender fully to him every day while he will never impose his will on us. He seeks voluntary submission of our lives to his ruling, ruling daily. And I don't know about you, but when I think of this aspect of him being king and him being ruler, all of a sudden my heart gets really defensive. I'm like, Jesus, I don't know if I want you to have that kind of control. I don't know if I want you to have that kind of authority in my life. I mean, the idea of relinquishing control of not being the master of my own fate, it challenges me deeply because I am so ingrained to desire autonomy. I don't know if you're like me, but it is hard to make Jesus king over my life. Because to be honest with you, I think I can do a fine job. I think I'm doing okay. Look at my life. I've got most of the things I want, God. Do I need you to have control? But when I say that, basically this is what I'm telling the world and myself. I'm a better king than Jesus. I'm a better king than Jesus. And none of us in here would go, maybe have the audacity to go, yeah, I'm a better king over my life than Jesus. Yet we live in such a way and we control our lives where we truly live out like we're better kings than he is. Jesus doesn't seek to negatively dominate your life, but he wants to lead your life in the direction that is best for you. And the only way to get this best direction in your life is to put him at his rightful place as king over your life. That is how he directs. Uh, For years, I worked in college ministry and I worked specifically with fraternity guys. And everybody always asked me, how is that? It's exactly how you'd imagine. I would do Bible studies at fraternity houses. They would somehow let me in. I don't know why, but God's favor. I would climb over like 
27, 30 racks of Keystone Light, and then it'd be all over the place. It'd be messy. It'd smell like beer. And I would share the gospel. I'd lead these Bible studies and just meet people where they were at. And one of my dear friends, I got to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with him from his freshman year to his senior year. And he'd always get so close to making Jesus king over his life. And one day I asked him, I go, what is holding you back? Why have you not embraced this yet? And he goes, Jason, I just don't think I can give over control. Like, I'm great that Jesus wants to save me. I'm great that he'll forgive me of my sin. But when you tell me he wants to be king over my life, I just can't relinquish that type of authority and control. What I appreciated about him is his honesty. Because the complete message of Jesus saving us is he's not just our savior. He is to be our king. He is to have an authority in our lives. And so today, as we talk about Jesus being king, and as we walk through this series, I think there's probably three types of people that have walked in here today when you view Jesus as king. The first person, you might be this, you, you're here and you're just questioning. You're going, is it really worth it? to make Jesus king? Like, I control my life. I do a pretty good job at it. Do I really want to trust him? Do I really want him to lead me in every way? If you're that person, my question for you is this. Do you really have that much control? You don't control time. You don't control how people think of you. Relationships, you don't control the world markets, the stock market, the weather. You don't control as much as you think you do. And when you think you have control, the coffee is going to spill in your life. You need to see that you don't have as much control as you think you do. And maybe Jesus is worth it. The second person, maybe in the past, you have made Jesus king over your life. You had a time in your life where you surrendered and you go, yes, Jesus is king. Yet you are coming here right now and you're just struggling with one aspect of your life. There's one thing that you know Jesus wants to take authority over that you have never submitted to him. There's this thing in your life that you go, I know I'm supposed to give that to Jesus, but you're holding it back. My question for you is this, where are you holding back? What area is Jesus asking you to submit to him? And if you gave it to him, do you think he is a good king that would do better by you than you do by yourself? And a third person here today, he's your king. And daily you are trying to pursue him. It doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean that you have it all together, but you're following his leading. You're wanting to know him more and more. My question for you is this. Do you still believe he's good? Like he's the good King Jesus. Like he is worth following. That you're like, oh, every day he brings me joy. He is good and I want to submit my life to him. Not out of religious duty, but because he is good. You need a fresh surrender to his kingship. So over the next four weeks, as we talk about King Jesus, my prayer for you is to wherever you're at in those three people, that we would take steps to making Jesus king in an area of our life. So our goal over the next four weeks is basically we're going to take you through the story of the last moments of Jesus. Uh, Chapter 18 through 21 is Jesus's uh, betrayal. It's his death, it's his resurrection, and his promise of return. And what we want you to see is we want you to see that through this, he is establishing his kingdom where he is king. And Jesus is going to prove to be the best king the world has ever seen. He's going to prove it. He's going to prove that he is worth following. Yet Jesus is a very different king of this than the kings of this world. He is so different. And my hope for you this series is that you would see he is not like any king you've ever experienced. He is not like King Xerxes. He's not like King Charles. He's not like King James. That's LeBron. He's not like King Kong. He's not like the Burger King. 
He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. He is so different. He is so different. This is why in John 18, it says this. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. So each week, what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus as king and an attribute of him being king and how that attribute should lead us to want to submit our lives to his kingship. So today, we're going to look at the first attribute, which is Jesus is the humble king. And in John 18, there's basically three scenes that I'm going to walk you through. We have just multiple scenes. So we have three different uh, parts of the story, and I'm going to walk through different scenes. So the first scene is his betrayal. The second scene is where he's in this trial. And the third scene is where he's being sentenced to death. And so our first scene today is the scene of his betrayal, the scene of his betrayal. And I want you to see in this scene that the humble king protects his people. So here's what's happening. Jesus has just left the upper room. We've been discussing that the last few weeks. And he's going to this garden, the garden of Gethsemane. And he's walking towards it and he gets there and he feels this need to pray. And he tells his disciples, pray with me. And so he prays and he prays and he prays. And he looks back and all the disciples are asleep. Okay, so don't feel bad if you ever fall asleep in prayer. I've done it a bunch. They did it and Jesus is about ready to die. Anyway, so Jesus is now praying again. He's like, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up. So they wake up, pray with me, pray with me. He starts praying, starts sweating blood. And all of a sudden as he's sweating, the disciples fall asleep again. And then all of a sudden over the horizon, he sees his betrayer, Judas, with a riot coming towards him of people of the chief free and is coming at him. They have torches, they have weapons, they have lanterns. They're after Jesus. So we pick up here in verse four. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. I'm he. Jesus said, And Judas, the traitor, was standing there with them. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Again, he asked them, who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. So remember, the humble king protects his people. Jesus is a humble king, and he physically protects the disciples. Like the the whole crowd is coming. This riot is coming towards him, and what does he do? He walks in front of his disciples, pushes them behind, and and goes and actually asks, who are you looking for? He is protecting them physically. Because it says, I told you that I am he. If you're looking for me, then let these men go. Isn't it a little interesting to think? This is the power of Jesus. When he spoke, they fell down. When he told them, let him go, they let him go. Like what other leader of like this rebellion gets captured and they let all the followers go? Only the king of kings has the power to do that. He has the power to protect his people. He's also protecting them spiritually. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, If you look in verse four, it says, Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out. Jesus isn't like, oh, why is is this like riot coming towards me? Why is this crowd coming towards me? No, he knew what was happening. He knew his destiny. He knew that he was betrayed. He knew that he would get whipped. He knew he was going to the cross. And so he embraces it. And he protects the people spiritually because we need that spiritually. The disciples could not have life without that. You cannot have eternal life without Jesus' death and resurrection. He is protecting them spiritually. The good king, the humble king, protects his people. And what's crazy in the rest of the story is he just doesn't protect his people. He protects his enemies. Because the rest of the scene goes, Peter was like going to stand up for him. And so he takes a sword out and he slices one of the the guys that are trying to take Jesus, one of the guards, and slices his ear off. 
And everybody jumps back and Jesus literally picks the ear up and heals it back. He is a humble, humble king that protects his people and even his enemies. So they bound Jesus and they take him to see the high priest. So here we see the humble king. He protects his people. You know what prideful kings do? They protect themselves. Jesus had every opportunity to protect himself. He could have got out of the situation, yet he protects his people. This is why you want him as king. There aren't many people that think of you. There aren't many people that will lay down their life for you. There are not many people that will protect you. We live in a super prideful world where it's every person for themselves and Jesus is the humble king that protects you. This is our King Jesus. He cares for you. When there is danger, he protects you and brings peace. He takes the wrath of our sin. He bears it on the cross. He's protecting you spiritually from eternal punishment. When you're alone, he is with you. When you're afraid, he protects you. When you have no one to turn to, he says he will never forsake you. The humble king protects his people. You want the humble king. You need this king. So we go from the garden, scene one, to scene two. This is now taking Jesus to the trial. So they march Jesus to uh, uh, this courtroom. And there's two things happen happening simultaneously. You have Jesus in a courtroom. And then Judas had been, or sorry, Peter had been following Jesus from afar and stood outside the courtroom in this outside of the gates of the court. And so Peter's on the outside and we have Jesus on the inside of the court. So I'm gonna walk, walk through Peter first and then we'll go to Jesus. So here's what's happening with Peter. So Peter shows up and it says this in verse 17. You aren't one of this man's disciples too, are you? She asked Peter. He replied, I'm not. It was cold and the servants and officials stood around a fire they had made to keep warm. Peter was also standing with them, warming himself. A little bit of time passes. Still, he's outside. Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there, warming himself. So they asked him, you are one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it. He said, I'm not. And then one of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him. Didn't I see you with him in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Kaka! Needed to break it. That's a little hard. Peter's denial. I had to get a little laugh. Okay, let's go back into it now. Here's what's crazy. Jesus knows that Peter is going to betray him this entire time. Yet he loves him deeply. He even told Peter, you're going to deny me. You're going to forsake me. Yet Peter denies him and allows the fear, of con fear to control his life. Yet this never changes Jesus' love for him. Jesus is a humble king who is patient with people. We'll see this in uh, chapter 21, but Jesus actually has this amazing interaction with Peter where he restores Peter. He does not rebuke him for denying him. He restores him. He loves him. See, Jesus is patient in our weakness. He will always offer forgiveness and give a chance of redemption and restoration. He is the patient king, not a king that holds bitterness or disappointment over our heads. He's a humble, patient king. Okay, so while Peter is being questioned and denying outside, Jesus is actually being questioned and testifying inside a courtroom. Again, these are going at the same time. So we'll go back into verse 19. Here's what's going on in this scene. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and teaching. Jesus said, I've spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me. Surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest? He demanded. If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify as to what is wrong. 
But if I spoke the truth, why did you strike me? Jesus is king. He is Lord of lords. He knows his position. What king would allow false accusations against them? What king who has this kind of power would allow someone to slap him? What king would not retaliate for this behavior? The patient king, the humble king. Jesus had the power at any time to snap his fingers and get out of this. He could have brought down angels and he could have destroyed these people, yet he is not a typical king. Most kings, when they are threatened like this, they aren't patient. They take vengeance on their enemy, but not good King Jesus. He is humble. He is patient. You want a patient king because most people are not patient with you. Most people judge you immediately. When you do something stupid, most want to take advantage of your stupidity. They allow your downfall to be their opportunity. Jesus is the king. He doesn't hold your stupidity against you. When you deny him, he patiently waits for you. He never gives up. He, we deserve... He never gives up when we make him king over our lives. He doesn't repay our sin. He doesn't repay evil for evil. He is not afraid of having difficult conversations with you. You don't have to be afraid of repercussions from him. You can approach his throne room with joy, with peace, with love, and confidence. You can know at your darkest moments, he is a humble, patient king. You need this king. So our king, our humble king, he protects his people. He is patient with you. And lastly, when we see in scene three, we see his sentencing. And we see that the humble king, he is not pushy. Jesus will not force himself upon you. He will not push himself upon someone. So what happens in scene three? So this trial is done and they take Jesus from the high priest Caiaphas and they send him to the palace of the Roman governor named Pilate. And it's in the morning and Pilate's kind of confused. He's like, what are you bringing these charges to me for? Like, I'm the Roman like governor. Like, I don't need to deal with this. You guys have your own courtrooms. You should deal with Jesus on your own. Yet, the Jewish leaders begged him, no, we need you to judge him under your laws. And honestly, Pilate did not want to deal with it. He just wanted to be neutral. He's like, please don't make me deal with this. And the reason the Jews wanted him to be judged by Pilate is because Pilate had the power to execute him. Their laws did not allow for them to execute Jesus. So we pick up, he's in Pilate's palace, Jesus is, and it's the morning. In verse 33, it says this. Pilate then went back inside the palace. He summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea, Jesus asked? Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew, Pilate replied? Your own people and chief priest handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. Jesus just said he is a different king. You should, he is going to have a different kingdom. His kingdom is heaven. And if it wasn't, his servants would fight for him. He is the humble king. We go on to verse 37. It says, you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into this world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. What is truth, retorted Pilate. With this, he went out again to the Jews, gathered, and he said this, I find no basis for a charge against him. Isn't it so interesting, this conversation with Pilate? Pilate sees no wrong in Jesus. He sees no wrong in him, yet Jesus goes, my kingdom is not of this world. And, and Pilate goes on to, to, or Jesus goes on to say, this is the truth that I'm testifying to. And if you make me king, 
you are in the truth. Yet Pilate doesn't want to deal with the situation. Pilate's in a place where he just wants to be neutral. And so he, he finds this basis. I, I have no with him. And I, I, I think Pilate was like, I just want to get out of this situation. But there was a riot forming of the Jewish people at that moment. And they were wanting to crucify Jesus. And so Pilate is in a dilemma. He had to make a choice. He had to prevent chaos. And so Pilate goes, I can't make the choice. I'm going to be neutral. I can't be the one with the blood of Jesus on my hands, this humble king. So he walks out in verse 39, this is what he says. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, no, not him. Give us Barabbas. Pilate did not want to make a choice. He's like, I'll just let the people choose. And the people of that day, they chose the murderer Barabbas. And our humble king, he did not force himself on anyone. He allowed them to choose. He gave them a choice. So don't miss this. In this story, there are three different people and three different choices they had to make that day. One, you had the crowd and their choice was a murderer. They rejected Jesus as king. They chose to navigate life without him. They wanted to push him away. The second person we have in this story is Pilate. He opted for neutrality. He focused on what he control, could control, yet he missed the opportunity to make Jesus king that day. And lastly, there's a small group of people that day that were his followers. And they would watch him go to the cross. They would watch him die. But in that moment, as they saw the humble king headed towards his death, they said, we will follow you forever. They will follow you as King Jesus. Today, there are three types of people in this room. And I believe it's these three people. Maybe you walk in here today and you're kind of like the crowd and you're actively choosing to live life independently of Jesus. He's the best king. He's the only humble king. My petition for you right now is don't accept the things of this world. Don't go towards Barabbas. Choose Jesus. He loves you. He wants a relationship with you. He is the best king. If you want him to be king over your life, all it takes is a, a simple prayer saying, God, I, I, I want to leave following my own self as the king, and I want to make you, Jesus, king over my life. It's a declaration in your heart. And then the Bible says the very next step that we take when we make him king is that we get baptized. Why is that true? We get baptized because we go public with our faith. We are no longer following ourselves as king, but we are following Jesus as king. And it is a public declaration that I'm in a new kingdom, following a new king. And if you've never been baptized, we would love to help you take those next steps of getting baptized. Maybe you're here and you're pilot. You have this like neutral stance. There's something in your life that you're just like, I, I, I believe Jesus is king. I believe he's done nothing wrong. I, I see him, but I'm just neutral. And I, I, there might be this small part of your life that you've not given over to him. And you go, I want you to take this. I want King Jesus to take this in my life. Don't wait on bringing that portion of your life to him. He is good. He is humble. He wants to protect you. He will be patient with you. But he's not going to force you. You have to choose. You have to choose to make him king. And maybe you're here today and you're a follower of Jesus and you believe he is king, that he is Lord. 
I just wanna encourage you to keep choosing him. Others might leave, you choose King Jesus. Others might fall away, you choose King Jesus. Hard times might come, you choose King Jesus because you remember he is the humble king that loves you. See, controlling our life, it's futile. We aren't that good at kings anyway, are we? Jesus is the best king. He is the best king. He wants to protect you. He will be patient with you. But you have to choose him. Would you join me in prayer? God, we are grateful that you sent your son, Jesus, that he is not like any king of this world. He is a different king and he is the humble king. So we worship you, King Jesus. Let us allow ourselves to give you authority in our lives. Break whatever's holding us back from allowing you to be king because when you are king, our lives are better than we could ever imagine. So I pray right now as we move into this time of communion and worship that each person would evaluate themselves and go, What's one step I can take 